<laughs> um, thanks for coming. Um, I know a lot of us are struggling through hangovers from the beer last night. Um, contrary to Tony and Caro, I did have a few. I did try to leave early, but um, I was then forced to eat food and drink more um, <laughs> with other people. So, yeah. So, um, look, uh, yeah, I'm Tony Albrecht. Um, uh, I firstly want to thank uh, the other speakers for pulling this together at, the, at such short notice uh, and being happy to, to, to do this. Um, it, it's great. Um, before we start, I'm going to pull in a favour. Now, uh, at GCAP last year, uh, I uh, did a talk and I had a photo of myself, much younger self, much slimmer self, um, presenting. And since then, I've been adding more and more photos of myself, presenting myself, presenting myself, presenting myself. So this is a photo of me presenting at a conference, presenting a photo of myself, presenting at a conference, presenting a photo of me, presenting at a conference. So if someone could take a photo that has me and that photo in it, then I have another level of conception, um, conferenceception. And I'm going to turn my phone off because it's being noisy. Um, that'd be great. Thank you. So uh, as Tony mentioned, this is my 20th annual Aussie Game Dev Conference. And um, I re still remember my first conference that I went to. Uh, I, was, uh, I was like a lot of you, I was looking for work. Uh, I wanted to work in games. I knew that was the thing I had to do. Uh, I was in awe of the speakers. But you can only see one speaker at a time. So I wanted to fix that. So what I've done is I've got together a group of amazing speakers and we can see them all in one go. The other thing is the hangovers on the second day mean that 40 minutes of a single session is quite hard to get through. So this way you've got five minutes at a time, you can concentrate on that and you'll pick up some stuff as you go. So um, the way this is going to work is uh, I will introduce uh, a speaker, they will come up and they will talk for around five minutes. And it is a topic of their choice. Uh, the guidance was purely try and do something vaguely associated with the theme of GCAP uh, or whatever you want. So <laughs> I, I didn't want to constrain it too much. Um, so we've got some, some great talks. Um, I was pasting in the last talk this morning about an hour ago. Thanks, Rob. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, so these speakers are going to, uh, hopefully they're going to make you think. They might make you rethink some things you thought you knew. You may learn some things. Um, you may reaffirm some of your choices, potentially. So first up, I'd like to introduce Anna. So stick, stay, yes, there. Ah, excellent. OK, hello, y'all. I have reached that glorious point in my career where people actually ask me to rant about things. Yay. OK, so which means today I get to stand up here and have that serious talk, that one of those ones with your friends that go, look, I love you, but. So this is my, oh, I got it, yay, this is okay. Um, this is my, you know, I love you, but. As an industry, we need to grow up. So, and by growing up, I don't just mean let's all wear suits and, and discuss our you know, business card typefaces and shades of white. Um, but I mean, as an industry, it's time for us to pull up our socks, put on our big girl boots, and have a good hard look at ourselves. We need to look at how and what and why. And because I only have five minutes, I'm going to take a bit of a scattergun approach about my pet peeves. So, how? And how we do it, how we make games. This is the industry and its practices. So the first one is kind of obvious, consistently long hours and crunch. It's not healthy, it's not conducive to quality work, I don't even know why we're still having this discussion, just stop it. <laughs> not paying people for work, another one of those I can't believe we're still having this discussion. As employers, we have a responsibility under the law to pay people fairly for the work that they do. If you cannot do that, then don't be an employer, no ifs. No buts. You can arrange it somehow differently, but it is important to have fair work for fair pay. Working only with our friends. Now, I'm going to let you out on a little secret and a bit of a radical notion. You don't have to like the people you work with. Diver 
<laughs> Diversity, at its core, is about employing people who think differently and have different experiences. People who do not always agree, who challenge each other, but who are willing to work together for the find the best results. It is the spark of controversy between these two points where real innovation happens. Next one, probably another kind of sore point. Personal and professional. We're in industry. With such long hours and an all-consuming kind of industry, it can be hard to meet people outside of it. And that's totally understandable, but it's important to remember that it is an industry, that your personal life is personal and your professional life is professional. Some days it'll breed across, you know, we're only human, you'll have bad days and you'll have good days, but we need to do our best to keep it to a minimum. As a professional, I have absolutely zero interest in what you do in your personal time, as long as it has no effect on your professional work. So, yay! Um, eh, pages stuck. Okay, how we look and protect, look after and protect our staff, especially our minority staff. When you are a minority employee, you are by definition isolated. You need to make sure that you are aware of how this is and how what, what your company is like for your minority staff. When they raise issues with you, you need to listen and then you need to act. You need to prove that you are not just words, that you are action. Ah, yay, finally. Okay, Whew, little dance there. So what we do, the games we make and the mechanics they use. Now, I'm going to start with an obvious one, gambling mechanics. Loot boxes, other mystery boxes, or spin the wheels type thing. If they cannot be bought with premium currency, they may be the lucky dips to our legs, um, to, to the sort of slot machines, but they're still gambling mechanics. They still trigger in people's minds the same chemical mixes and all those same motivations. So we need to be really careful about how we use them. And the thing I ask all of you is next time you want to have a random prize box or a random loot box, is there another way that we can do this? Is there some other way that we can actually get the same result without relying on a gambling mechanic? Accessibility. And by accessibility, I don't just mean, you know, physical disability. I mean accessibility to all people. So, I mean, we need to be very aware of, you know, our hostiles in our game not being, insert, non-Anglo, you know, foreign-speaking person here. We should have positive representations of body types. We should explore non-Anglo, non-cis, non-Western narratives. And we need to explore mechanics that solve problems without using violence. We can do better, so let's hold ourselves to account and do it. Next one, ethics, yay! We need to look at what values our mechanics are portraying, and they do have values, from the make yourself a good person tofu or fable, through to the upgrade your partner star rating Kim Kardashian. Our mechanics are making value judgments. It's time we think seriously about the values our mechanics are promoting and what habitual behaviors we are encouraging. So. I think I just broke this thing. Yes, aha, ah, back one, come on, yeah, why? Kind of give you a preview there. Okay, so why we are building what we're building. So often the number one reason is to make money, and that's fair, that is totally fair, but be honest about it. You know, I know why I wanna make games. I wanna make games because I see so many being made that call on existing cultural narratives and tropes with very little reflection and understanding of their original context or meaning. The stories become reflections of reflections, kind of like through a funhouse mirror. These games may be fun, sure, but they don't have any real desire to explore the meaty issues, to ask themselves what it means to be human. I want to bring my rather obsessive passion for classic literature, comparative religions, cultural theory, history and anthropology to game development to prove that games can, can contribute to cultural capital in a way that is unparalleled in any other media. I also know that the games I have made throughout my career have not been that. I justified it by saying I had to learn the tools of my trade to understand how to build the things well so that I can make things that last. But the reality is, I was making games for someone else's profit. 
Yes, the players enjoyed them, but they also used all the tricks of the trade to get people to spend money and keep spending it. It's not all bad, however. We have a chance, we have a choice. And like the Australian environment, we need to burn away the old so we can make room for new growth. We can choose to do it in a controlled way when the weather is cool and the flames can be kept low. Or we can do nothing and wait till it burns us all without mercy. The fire rips, sorry. The good thing is, this is not something we have to do on our own. It is something that all of us, each and every one of us, can contribute to. So let's make a commitment here and now for each of us to grow up together. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Anna, for that seven minute, five minute talk. Um, <laughs> next, uh, Rob. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Rob, I'm a designer in Los Angeles, I work on God of War team, which is great. Um, but this is Earthworm Jim. Uh, you might remember Earthworm Jim, it was a sort of, you might call it a run and gun platformer game and uh, it was designed by Dave Perry and uh, sort of designer slash animator Doug Tenapel. And it came out in 1994, um, I was 12 when Earthworm Jim came out. One of the cool things about <laughs> Earthworm Jim, he could actually use his limbless body for all sorts of activities. So he could actually swing his, his sort of worm-like head around like a helicopter and, and decay down, or he could actually like rip himself into two and use himself as a whip. And they really sort of nailed the feeling of being a worm. But, um, <laughs> but actually probably the most memorable thing about Earthworm Jim was the art direction. It's really reminiscent of the John Chris Falusi sort of style of the early 90s. Uh, there was a lot of things around this era, about 1990 to 1994, that you probably remember as like Ren and Stimpy, perhaps, or um, tonally, Earthworm Jim was actually starting to tap into things like Beavis and Butthead and later MTV oddities. They sort of focused on the hyper-gross details and sort of unnecessary grotesque. And, I would describe it as maybe the mastery of the weird and the uncanny. So in a lot of ways, Earthworm Jim, if you're a gamer and you were like 12 years old, Earthworm Jim might be the perfect encapsulation of what it felt like to be a, a teenager in the early 90s. Because if you were 12 when Earthworm Jim came out, it was pretty cool. <laughs> so cut forward to 2002, Australian industry was really taking off, which is great. Uh, it was an awesome time to be an art or an animation student, which I was. And the Australian industry and the film industry were generating a lot of opportunities for different people. These are some of my favorite Aussie games, in particular Freedom Force, but there were a lot of others as well. And uh, I thought this would be a, a great time to get into the games industry. But um, I actually finished art school with a diploma in computer graphics and animation and found myself very much out of work. <laughs> and so I kind of wasn't really sure what to do next. So I did the only logical thing that I could think of, which was to start emailing every game designer you know, around the world who was maybe foolish enough to actually leave their email on the company's website. <laughs> and actually, someone got back to me. It was Dave Perry, the designer of Earthworm Jim. And he did actually have helping students as a passion of his. He had a whole website where you could look at all the different roles of the different companies. And he did actually reply back to me and give me tons of good advice. One of the pieces of advice he gave me was to keep going and to just persist. And most importantly, he sort of helped me to readjust my expectations. He told me, don't worry about what Rareware is doing, focus on a local opportunity. Take anything that will present itself. I get that you want to work on you know, an insomniac game, but what's going on locally? Start small, get experience, and, and persist. And it was really good advice, um, because the first gig I worked on wasn't even really a game. It was DJ Rupert, an animation contract, which was not industry leading by any means, but you know, I did my job and I, I worked really hard on it actually. I got paid $300 and it took me about a month. <laughs> I think they were hoping it would take a week. 
But, you know, it wasn't great, but it did help me build my resume because about six months later, I, I got a job at Chrome Studios as a level designer, which was a real dream job if you're an artist, animator, designer in the early 2000s. And a year later, I, I did email Dave Perry back with this, you know, fancy new job in hand and let him know I'd made it through the first gate. And he actually got back to me once again, but with some sort of wisdom about now how to be a team member. He was like, oh, you got through the first gate. And this was his advice. Um, he said, congratulations, you're on the right track. Absorb everything you can from this point, design, programming, and art. And then perhaps most importantly, think of yourself as a building an RPG character, try to max up every stat. And that's advice I do pass along to students, you know, uh, all the time. And it's always been great advice for me. Um, I started in this industry 15 years ago. And on the plane coming back here, I was reminded just how hard it was to get started. So my rant's really simple. Um, if you're an experienced professional in this room, it's our duty to take time to invest in the next generation, just like Dave did for me. Um, look, the walls we've built ourselves are not just creative walls, and they're not just um, financial walls. They're also process walls, and they're also knowledge walls. Perspective and experience, it's very important to break down those walls and help people understand how they can actually be successful. So I'll be making a commitment today. If you email me at Rob Davis or rob.davis at sony.com or you tweet me, I'll definitely be getting back to you if you're a student or whether you're just getting started. And I don't think it's so unreasonable to ask the same of all the professionals here today. So that's my rant, and I would like if everyone here could make that same commitment. Thank you. Awesome stuff, Rob. Um, our next speaker. Ah, yes, Zaf, you're up. Hi, I'm too short to see some of these screens. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Zaf. I am. I do stuff. Where's the thingy? This thingy? This thingy? <gasps> okay. Um, my rant's about needing writers because I am a writer at my core. I do narrative design, editing, podcasting, lots of other stuff that I love, but. I'm a writer, um, and your game probably needs a writer if you don't have one. Maybe if it doesn't have any writing in it, it might not, but you probably still need someone involved in story stuff. Um, but your game needs a writer, or just because you can put words on a page doesn't mean you can put good words on the page. Just because you can write, write, doesn't mean you can write, right? <laughs> so writing is an actual professional skill, right? Oh, my alarm's going off. That's fine. Um, writing is an actual professional skill that people train. We go to university, we do courses, we practice, we write every day, we read voraciously, not just fiction, but also nonfiction about how to write better. We practice, like I said, we practice a lot, we write a lot. It's an actual skill, like any other skill, like programming, like art, that you need to refine. And people who are just beginning can be good writers. Natural talent is a thing, but there's nothing that replaces actual experience and knowledge, right? So narrative design, on the other hand, is an even more specialized field. So just because you can write doesn't mean you can design narrative. Um, not to say you shouldn't try. If you want to get into it, absolutely go for it. Um, but yeah, these are fields that you need to learn properly. So if you want a game to have good writing, a good story, good characters, emotionally compelling story beats, and fun or interesting dialogue, which you know are good things to have in a game, you should probably get a writer, because Jim, who does programming, probably can't write as good words. And you know, he's also programming. Um, there we go. Everyone's got a novel, right? It's like the joke, like everyone's writing a novel. But how many people actually finish their novels? Everyone could write a novel if they committed to it, but how many people actually commit to it and actually finish that novel, revise it, edit it, do all the work you need to do and get it out there and can then work with the editing team, your agent, all of that stuff to get it there. Like all of the skills you need to finish writing a game, basically. Um, I'm writing a novel too. Who isn't? But I'm actually on the sixth revision of it, full through. So like, there's different levels of novel writing, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, so to write a big thing, you do need a strong understanding of character, plot, theme, tension, blah, 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 all the stuff that you kind of need. You need an understanding of it, right? Not just like, I've read the Wikipedia page and I know what these words mean. You need to actually understand how they work together and know how to make that flow work so that your player, when they're reading these words, doesn't just like think it's dumb or boring or whatever, or like that there's way too much text on the screen 
when you could have gotten a writer to come in and condense that into one sentence that worked just as well. You need the discipline to draft, revise, iterate, edit, work with a team, cooperate, communicate, not have too much ego about your story, because that is definitely a thing with beginning writers and also long-term writers. Um, and you also need to be able to finish it to its end. To its end, that is like the most important thing is being able to finish the thing you're writing. Anyone can start a thing. Anyone can start writing a thing. It seems easy because we write every day, right? We just write words. That's how we communicate. But you need to actually be able to take this thing from an idea and write it all the way through and then finish it. And that finishing of a story can be incredibly hard. Very, very hard. And if you haven't done it and you haven't practiced doing it, it doesn't get any easier. Oh, wait, there's a screen on there. But it's so expensive to hire a writer and a programmer can write stuff when they're not busy. Professionals cost money because they know what they're doing and it's a valuable service, right? You wouldn't just be like, I can code. I can make code work. Doesn't mean you'd hire me or ask me to code a thing. That's not, you wouldn't want that. It would not be good, right? Everyone would know it was bad coding. Um, you could probably get me to draw art for your game. I can draw. I can make people look like people. It doesn't mean it'll look good. It doesn't mean people will want to look at your game. It's the same with words. Just because there are words there, it doesn't mean that they're words that people will want to read. People don't inherently want to read everything unless they're a weirdo like me who reads every single shampoo bottle in every single store. Um, mostly players, they're not here to read stuff unless they're playing visual novels, right? And even then, you don't want to like click through 10 pages worth of visual novel writing that doesn't give you anything, right? It's, it's the worst feeling. And like, if you've got something like an RPG like The Last of Us, if your dialogue's bad, nobody's gonna wanna play that game because so much of that game is built on the character and the story. So if you consider a story a spare time or like second job kind of thing, it won't get the attention it deserves and it will fall flat. Um, I was going somewhere with that and I forgot what it was. I have no notes, why did I do that? Um, <laughs> so writing is, you know, something that should be there from the start, or at least considered from the start, bringing in a writer, like, being like, okay, we'll bring in a writer, we'll bring them in the last month to, like, chuck some story on top. It's not gonna be as good, it's not gonna be actually in your game, really, it's just gonna be on top and flat, and your writer's gonna be trying their best, but it's not great, it's not fun, and it's worse for your game. It means you don't actually care as much about your player's experience as you think you do. Your game will actually benefit from a writer, if they're part of the team, from the start. From the start in particular, um, writers can do a lot of stuff. It's not just like, you know, writing in the game. They can write documentation for you, all of like the documentation, that's the same thing, Saf. Um, they can like outline stuff for the team. They can write briefs about story and design stuff. Um, depending on the writer you've got, they often have other talents because writing in games is hard. Um, like, I do design work as well, and I can write social media and stuff like that. Um, so having a writer around is real useful and good for your game. And if you can't afford a writer, maybe don't do a story game. Might be a good idea. I see a lot of people do that. Don't do that. Every other field has specialized writers that are considered knowledgeable and respected in their field, unless you're talking about online journalism. But that's mostly people reading the online journalism. Um, like there's technical writing, people marketing writing, which is the worst, and all of, all of the different kinds of writing, right? Every field has writing. Someone is writing that information on your shampoo bottle. Someone is writing the newspaper. Someone is writing the blurb on the book you're reading, right? There's writing everywhere, and the people doing that know what they're doing. They're paid for it, they're respected for it. You don't just get any old Joe off the street and be like, hey, hey, can you just like write the copy on this milk carton for me, please? We need some writing. Like, why would you do that? So why would you do that in games? Games that are largely based around storytelling, whether or not you're intending to tell a story, you tell a story, stories come in games. That is why this medium is so good, is because it is such a, an amazing field for like telling new and different stories, right? And that is often ignored because why would we wanna do that? Um, so hire a writer, just hire one. Like even if it's, even if it is just at the end to make your writing better, right? Like it's, it, it will help. <laughs> it's not the best case scenario, but it will help a lot. And also pay them good rates. Like when you hire a contracting writer um, and they're like, hey, it costs this much an hour or this much for these many words or whatever. And you're like, whoa, that's a lot of money. It's probably because they're not getting paid that much by anyone else and that they really need that money. And also because their writing is good and they know what they're doing. Like. Game writers in particular are specialized towards game writing. Um, you may not want to like 
hire a prose or screenwriter necessarily because they may not know as well. But yes, do that. Hire them, pay them good rates, and also please hire me. Thank you, Seth. Um, I know I said I wouldn't make people uh, stick to the five minutes, but what I'll do is when we hit five minutes, I'll stand up. It doesn't mean stop, it means talk faster. Okay? <laughs> so um, next we have Nick. That's not a slide I sent you, Tony. Oh, yeah, this slide. This is the only slide, too, which uh, would imply that the quality of my talk is really great if there's no slides, but you'll, you'll be surprised. Uh, I also might have chosen something more substantial if I knew it was such a big room, but anyways. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things uh, that have been on my mind recently and hope that they co cohere into something, uh, something related to gardening specifically. Uh, and don't hate me until the end, then you can make a decision. Uh, and I'll probably be under five minutes, so. Um, when Tony asked me to do a lightning talk, I immediately thought, uh, what controversial opinions do I have? Uh, and by the way, I worked at uh, PlayStation for a long time, which is how I know Tony, and then Oculus for a bit, uh, sort of indie biz dev relations, um, and now I've been independent for about a year, so anyway. Uh, so what controversial opinions do I have? Uh, well, I'm usually not so brazen about this, um, but I'm really not the biggest Nintendo fan. Uh, <laughs> I love my Switch as a great portable indie machine, but I don't really care about most Nintendo developed games. Um, I don't really have nostalgia for their franchises. I didn't really grow up with them uh, that much, and I don't feel like they really grew up with me. And I've had enough Mario and Zelda games for a lifetime. I don't, I don't need more. Uh, I'd rather have new IP and new worlds from them, and it's been a while. Like, I love Pikmin, but there hasn't been that much new IP from them since then. And until Breath of the Wild, uh, their games were really over-tutorialized with not a lot of sense of mystery or discovery, and they felt more childish to me than childlike. Um, and as a community, we really uh, value innovation really highly and hold AAA games to a high standard, as we should. Uh, so it bothered me just a little bit when everyone went crazy when the new Animal Crossing was announced for Switch, just by name only, because that's like the least surprising announcement possible. And how quick we are to forget that the last Animal Crossing was sort of a more cynical mobile game that didn't really you know, stick around and stay relevant in a big way. And maybe, just maybe, uh, we should hold Nintendo to a higher standard than that. And maybe we should wait to see more of the game and expect more even from our comfort food. However, of course, I don't blame anyone or begrudge anyone for being excited about something. That's not me. Uh, and I've played dozens of hours of Animal Crossing on DS and GameCube, and it's a great series. I get it. But that got me thinking, what am I really annoyed about, actually, in that situation? Uh, and I think it's because we just allow Nintendo to sort of do the bare minimum with the series and dominate that genre by themselves. And why are there not more gardening games? Uh, why is it so rare that we have the opportunity to get excited by something like Animal Crossing? And why is there not just like a chill game that I want to play on my phone and check in casually every day? Uh, how is that possible that there's not more of those things? Uh, and I think about how my partner back home plays a game called Plant Nanny, uh, which encourages players to drink more water so that every time she drinks a glass of water in real life, she gets to go open the app and water her plants in the app, um, and then you grow a cute little garden of anthropomorphic plants. And I don't just mean literal gardening. Uh, a few weeks ago at the roguelike celebration in San Francisco, where I live, um, I saw uh, Max Kraminski give a great talk called Gardening as a Mode of Play. I'd really encourage you to watch it online. Um, he talked about games that, in his words, have lots of small, largely independent generative processes, Games that distribute content over time instead of over space, which I thought was interesting. Uh, and in the context of procedural games, content generation that occurs on a time based on a real-life calendar and clock rather than on demand when the player just goes to a new area. And he goes way more in-depth than that. You should really watch it, but it got me thinking about a lot of this. And I've also been thinking about ritual. Uh, my friend Doug Wilson, who lives here, a local developer, and he teaches at RMIT, he's spoken a lot about games as a ritual. And actually, his daily ritual of playing just one run of Splunky every day uh, is what led to the invention of the game's daily challenge mode, which is really now a popularized feature across countless other games. Um, and I've played games as a ritual myself, including the first Unravel game. Uh, I would play one level before bed every night, and it's like a really beautiful, peaceful game, uh, and it was a really nice way to play it and sort of wind down for the evening. Um, for a couple weeks, and like I mentioned, my partner plays uh, Plant Nanny every day and often some Stardew Valley as well, and she doesn't binge on it, uh, but it's a really regular positive ritual, and she has a positive relationship to those games. 
And I think ritual and gardening might go hand in hand. And I think those things together create a lot of the appeal behind Animal Crossing. And roughly in that same genre, I think about people have been excited for Ooblet, how excited people are for Ooblets, which I've heard mentioned a bunch of times you know, yesterday, and Mineko's Night Market, and how big Neko Atsume was a few years ago. But are there even any others that really jumped to mind? I mean, there weren't a lot for me. Um, and these are hard games to make, I get it. Uh, and Animal Crossing is a hard thing to compete with. But why don't we try? And instead of making another puzzle platformer and giving ourselves a really high degree of difficulty in a genre that overall is one of the least successful, why not try to be a bigger fish in a smaller, underserved pond? So really, I want to see your gardening games. And personally, I would genuinely rather play them than a new Animal Crossing. That's just me. Uh, so, grow your garden beyond the walls, and thank you. Thanks, Nick. Spot on. Jane, you're up. Hello. Words are good. Words are good. All right, I need some more enthusiasm. I know it's early. Okay. We have heard from every, well, not everybody, but we're about to hear from everybody. And the thing that we all have in common is that we have stories and we have words to share. And you think about storytelling as the cornerstone of humanity. We evolved and we've been telling stories since we could form words and grunt, and then it evolved into cave paintings. And then we eventually got into scrolls and the Gutenberg press, and that kind of made words a little bit more available to everybody. And we're kind of in this interesting space right now where we've seen the evolution of film and television and now into digital media. And you know what? There's an unprecedented impact in the world in digital storytelling right now. It is such an exciting time to be in games, don't you see? Don't you think? Why are you here if you are not excited about that? <laughs> what is the impact that you want to have right now? Now, I'd like, if you feel like you have a story in you that you need to have in game form, please raise your hand. And I'd like you to just take a look around the room. Keep holding your hands up. Look around the room. And that tells you how many stories are dying to come to light in this room. We each have a story. And the thing is, we all have the power to have impact on other people. Who tells the stories has the power. I wonder if there is in this room the next William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, even Dante, some amazing storyteller that 20, 50, 200 years from now will be remembered for our work in digital media. How exciting is that? We are in the second or third wave of indie games, and anything is possible because we have these amazing tools that are becoming democratizing the games industry, and crafting powerful stories is one part talent and five parts dedication and probably hiring professional writers or learning the craft, right? Absolutely. It's all about learning the craft and what it is to be good with words and good with stories because we do have, we all have stories. So I had this power for revelation a few months ago that most of the stories that I had been consuming were by women. Yay, girls, right? Woo! <laughs> Except I realized that all of the stories that I was consuming were by white women. And that made me realize, holy shit, I have a blind spot. What if we all took a moment to think about the stories that we are consuming and where they're coming from? Are we consuming content that's written only by men? white men, women, white women. Um, there is so much more diversity in storytelling and games that we need to be consuming and amplifying. And so that's one of the things that I really want to get across is that we have an ethical duty and moral obligation as digital storytellers to make sure that we're amplifying voices that are underrepresented. Now, I don't know if you noticed on the slides, I tried to keep it pretty simple. Good words, do good, do good with words, and with. The number one thing that I want each of you to realize is that when you held up your hand and you looked at the other people that are in this auditorium who are at this conference, you are not alone. 
If you have a story that's in you and you feel like it is solely your story, believe it or not, there's somebody else on this planet that has that same story. You are not alone. There's community in the world that want to do good through this medium. And if you feel alone, you might not be looking hard enough for your tribe. I know for me that it feels like every story matters. Every story matters. Your words matter. And I hope that you'll take the time to really think about your impact in the games industry and get excited and share your story. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, the reason that the crowd didn't respond very well is because we're Australians. <laughs> so, uh, next, uh, Keith. Hi there. I hail from Wisconsin, USA the northern central part of the states where folks are known for avoiding conflict and being polite and overly conciliatory. Uh, in fact, when introducing myself to those from outside of the US, I refer to Wisconsin as the Canada of America. Uh, but today, I've been afforded the rare opportunity to be incensed about something important for five straight minutes, so F all that, we're talking about leadership. I was a AAA studio developer for 11 years. In 2010, I started doing consulting for game companies in leadership and culture and people operations because I was tired of seeing impossible milestones paid for with the currency of developers' lives. Milestones whimsically decreed by publishers or cavalierly determined by studio leaders or carved in stone to meet the marketing schedule. I've seen sleep disorders, chronic stress fatigue, dissolved relationships, broken marriages, and children separated from their parents because mom or dad is always at work. I fully grasp how inhumane that is because I live in America, which means I know a few things about separating children from their parents. I want to see all this fixed. So for the past eight years, I've spoken with dozens and dozens of companies around the world in every sector of our industry, and based on that fact alone, there are a few things I can tell you about leadership with possibly the greatest level of authority of anyone you know. First off, there are some companies out there that are doing it right. They place a high value on their people. They lead them well. They see to it they're healthy and that they're learning and growing. But don't get me started on that, this is a rant, dag on it. For the past several years as a consultant trying to teach leadership development and cultural improvement, let me describe how almost every single one of my industry encounters has gone when meeting someone for the first time. Hi, I'm Keith. I help develop leaders in healthy cultures. The conversation diverges at this point. 80% of the time I get this response. That is so awesome. My company really needs that. I, I wish you could talk to my boss. The other 20% of the time I get this. Oh, that's nice. Our industry could use that, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah this company's fine, though. Guess which one of those people runs the company? <laughs> and therein lies one of the greatest obstacles between where we are today and a future where game companies act on their purported values of treating their people like their greatest asset, pride. On the whole, executives in our industry have a grand inability to admit the imperfections of the company they run. If your studio is so flawless, sir or madam, why do so many of your employees wish fervently that you would hire me to fix it? Sadly, there really is no short game solution here. It's simply not possible to engage a CEO in rational discourse for a few minutes, state a couple of facts about the health impact of overwork or the monetary impact of employee turnover, and have them come away with an immediate change of heart and a desire to promptly reallocate their resources to prioritize the well-being of their people. If it were, I'd be hosting this event on my own island. My own floating space island. Happily, there is a longer-term play available to us. As I shared with a group of fabulous scholars just this week, here's how we got to this state. Our industry was jump-started by people who didn't know what they were doing as leaders. As time went on, they brought in more generations of developers who only had bad examples to learn from. 
and here we are a few decades later. We've got a two-step solution in front of us. And the first step is simple. Wait out the previous generations of shoddy leaders. Uh, like I said, this, this is the long game. Uh, but let's focus on step two of the solution, educate the next generation. To that end, a few quick words for those new to the industry or looking to get in. Know your own values and don't work someplace that will ask you to ignore them. Set limits on what you'll do or not do for a company and don't work someplace that wants you to break those limits. And a final word for the studio leaders, oh my gosh, if you put the word passionate in one more article backpedaling away from the pride you take in seeing people overworked, or in one more entry-level job description luring in a starry-eyed university graduate, I will strangle someone with piano wire because all of us who are no longer entry-level are well aware that your use of passionate is code for we will happily exploit anyone who is bad at setting personal boundaries. Thanks for coming. Great. Now I feel bad for saying I wanted passionate speakers. Um, <laughs> Kate, thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize that was going to be the picture. Um, anyway, on that note, let's talk about uh, what comes next. Resistance is futile. Why acting as a collective body is a good thing for this industry and especially for you. So, um, yeah, it's been a tough year for the industry, hasn't it? We've heard a lot of shit happen. This is back in July. It, was, it rocked the industry. Oh my God, what happened? What happened in this company? It had such a great reputation. August, we hear about this, Riot Games, culture of sexism. It's like, what the hell, Riot? We thought you were a good company. We thought you were doing the right thing. And it's like we hear this story echo and echo and all the stories that have gone since then. September, Telltale, you're gone. Instantly gone. You even hired people the week before you folded. How dare you? You had people moving to your company across country to work for you, and the next week you folded because your management fucked up. They didn't understand what they were doing in terms of the business model. And this rocks our industry again. And then what happens now? October, just a couple weeks ago, the revelation about Red Dead Redemption 2, that we work 100-hour weeks. What's the big deal? Of course, there's been a lot of positive and negative reaction from that, from Rockstar employees, as there should be. I'm sure there's good examples where people, like, I don't work 100 hours. But nonetheless, this is, again, a huge reflection on our industry and where we've been heading. And it's like, I thought it's supposed to get better. I thought as we go along and we evolve, as we try and grow up as an industry, I thought we're supposed to do better than this. And then just a couple days ago, again, another studio lays off a third of their workforce. A lot of it is because, yeah, I get it. Plans change, funding doesn't come through. But again, why are you not anticipating this as management? This is your job. You are supposed to be the caretakers and the shepherds of the people who work for you. You're not supposed to basically lead them blindly into this, you know, basically a blind trust about what your future holds. I love this quote that came out of one of the articles associated with one of these stories, that games are made by people, and if we care about games at all, we need to take care of the people who make them. And I love what she said, in fact, I think we need to care about the people a lot more than we care about the games. This is a fundamental shift that we have to see, not only, I think, in our own industry, but also on the consumer side. And that's where I think a lot of the shift needs to happen as best as we can. Now, if you heard my closing keynote last year, I, I focused a lot on this topic about that evil triumphs when good people do nothing. And that's been a driving force in my life for many years now. It's what drives my advocacy. And um, basically, when we see a lot of these stories happening, that's essentially the core of what's going on. There's good people in this industry all over the place, but we don't act. We're not stepping up and speaking out in the way that we, res we should in a responsible way. I also talked about having righteous rage. I'm sure and I, sh I surely hope that all of these stories really, really piss you off. It pisses me off, obviously. Um, I hope it makes you angry as well because it's a sense of injustice that's going on in this industry that this kind of bullshit keeps continuing without 
accountability. And it just keeps rolling forward and rolling forward. So we have to find our rage. We have to kind of focus it on the cause of injustice. How are we going to fix this? It's a form of righteous rage. So what do we have to do? We have to focus that rage on a cause. Figure out exactly what is bugging the shit out of you and try and fix it, even if it's a very local level. We have to be very vocal against this as a group. Um, we have to support one another in this, in this vocal opposition. We have to act with collective will. And I think that's one of the key things that has been missing for decades in this industry is the talent in this industry has not been willing to band together and act as a force of good for the benefit of their profession and the benefit of our creative, uh, you know, basically what we do. Um, now, collective action typically occurs when a number of people work together to achieve a common objective. That's the definition of collective action. And a lot of people have asked me over the last year or several years, why hasn't this happened in the industry? Why haven't we seen more collective action? Well, the reality is that it's tough. It's, it's long been recognized it's from sociological studies and psychological studies that it's really hard for people uh, who work together to actually band together towards common good. We know that there is all kinds of centrifugal forces in this world that pull us apart rather than centripetal forces that pull us together. My hope is that what we're seeing in this industry right now is much more of a bonding force that we have to stop this future. This is not the future we want for our industry. We thought that this wasn't where we were going to be in the same way that me being in the U.S., I didn't think this is where my country is going to be either, but that's another topic. Um, there are efforts out there that are starting to focus on collectivism. They're starting to focus on, on what do we do to move the conversation forward in order to protect us as talent in this industry to give us the working conditions that we desire, that we deserve as, as working professionals. I myself, I'm working on something called a game Creators Legal Defense Fund. That's an effort that I'm doing as well. And um, this whole talk is kind of a prelude for my discussion at 1130. Um, but anyway, there are ways to fix this. There are ways for us to band together and to have the dialogue about how we can, band can actually fix all of this, these issues. So, um, I don't know if you're Star Trek fans. I don't care if you are. If you're not, that's okay. If you know what the Borg are, you know, I'm, I want you to read this together with me. This is our mantra now. If you know what the Borg are, they basically invade and take over civilizations and, and make them conform to what they want. That's who we are. This is kind of a cube. It's kind of black. It's got green in it, so it's a perfect setting. We've got all these Borg in here, so repeat after me. Are you ready? We are the talent. Come on. Well, read it with me, okay? Lower your egos and surrender your desktops. We will add our artistic and technological excellence to your games. Your management culture must adapt to service us. Resistance is futile. Thank you. Resistance is futile. Uh, it's me. Hi. Um, I got a lot of slides. So, um, 20 years. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> 20 years ago, I landed my first paid programming job um, doing video games. It was amazing. I was so happy. I had my dream job. Everything was awesome. Uh, I was doing something cool, something I love, something new, something interesting. But I remember being at a family barbecue, and uh, I was bragging about how cool my job was. And my auntie said something to me that I still remember. She said, why aren't you doing something useful? You're a smart guy. Why aren't you using your intelligence to make a difference? And you know what? I think she had a point. So I'm going to throw this back at you guys. Game devs are the most creative, intelligent, socially aware group of people that I know of. So I want to ask you all, are you doing something useful? Are you doing something useful with your life, with your skills, your education, your ability? Are you making a difference? Or are you wasting your talent writing games that do nothing other than rot the minds of our children, encouraging them to buy pointless premium currency to purchase digital items that serve no point other than to fill your coffers? Or are you working towards something that benefits humankind? Your mathematical and computational skills could be used to build new spaceships, new propulsion systems, or encouraging our youth to be interested in these things. 
You could be helping to craft living environments for our astronauts, making sure that they can live and be safe up there. You could be helping to plan space stations or the first craft that will take humans to Mars. You could be training astronauts. What about space exploration? Programmers, what about applying your skills to help discover new stars, new solar systems, new planets? Meanwhile, back at home, on our cosy little planet, we have another set of problems. Our careless use of fossil fuels is changing our global climate. What are you doing about it? Are you raising awareness? How are you educating people to deal with this? Are you teaching them about the politics and policy around climate change, about the things that they will need to change for the human race to deal with this? Have you seen the impact that social media and the media in general has on, had on politics, on our opinions? Maybe you could be doing something to enlighten people as to the impact of how the media we choose to consume influences the choices that our leaders make for us. What about race relations? Instead of writing games about shapes and colours, maybe you should be helping us to better understand people of different colours and cultures and our inherent biases. Maybe you could educate people to question what they see and hear in the news. Educate them to question themselves and their own prejudices, their own preconceived ideas and their traditions, the lies that they hold close to their hearts. Maybe you could do that by helping people see through others' eyes, to live their lives again through another, help them to see that we're all human, we're all the same. But no, no, you want to write games. What about the way our leaders manipulate us? Maybe you could teach people to question the very politicians that are there to supposedly serve us. Can you encourage people to question authority? And what about casting a magnifying glass over our current politics? Maybe you could become a journalist and write detailed diatribes about those in power whom you would disagree with. And what about the atrocious ways that we treat our refugees, particularly in Australia, not just America? Are you helping people see life from the point of view of those less fortunate, their struggles, their injustices, their mental health? Are you encouraging inspection of unjust policy? And it's not just asylum seekers that suffer with mental health problems. You could be helping to educate, helping to inform and enlighten the healthy amongst us to better understand those that struggle. Are you? Or are you just writing games? It doesn't have to be just the big mental health issues. Simple things like bullying and teasing can have a dramatic and lasting effect on our children. Are you helping them or are you just making games? And what about physical health? Instead of writing games that are just eye candy, you could be applying your skills to help rehabilitate those that are struggling with physical issues, actually helping people to get better. There are all sorts of illnesses and psychological issues that could be, you could be looking at and trying to rehabilitate ADHD, depression and autism to name just a few. But no, you want to write games. How about instead of encouraging people to sit around, instead of encouraging people to sit around all day playing games, you exercise them, make them fitter and healthier, healthier instead of fatter and sicker. Or how about, how about the detection of illnesses and disabilities? You could be building tools that help professionals and civilians identify potential health issues. Are you? Or are you just writing games? Maybe your passion is for tiny things. If that's the case, maybe you could work with the science of discovery. You could be helping to identify or understand protein function in cells. What about looking at DNA? Protein folding, to take one example, could help find cures for HIV AIDS, many types of cancer, and possibly even Alzheimer's. Why aren't you working on that instead of making games? If the treatment and cure of cancer is not for you, what about helping with treatment from a mental side? Battling cancer is hard. Can you help with that? The mind has a huge impact on the body, so maybe you could be helping those suffering to keep their heads up and maintain a positive attitude as they struggle through an incredibly tough battle. On the other side of treatment and mental support, there is at least understanding, helping people to comprehend the impact that death and disease has on individuals, on families, on friends. If medicine and science is not for you, what about education? Surely that's something of value. Teaching people new skills, enabling them to learn at their own rate. Teach them something creative. Everyone loves creative stuff. What about some of the softer sciences? Geography, maybe? Or history? History is useful, as they say. Those who do not, do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Or you could go philosophical. Ethics might be something you could work with. Maybe you just want to make people think, give people a glimpse of the horror that mankind is capable of, of choices that have no good options. Maybe you just want to give people a place to make different choices about life and friendship in a place where they can safely explore without hurting themselves or anyone else, a playground for the mind. There are a lot of jobs you could be doing, useful jobs. 
jobs that help people, jobs that are fulfilling, jobs that make a difference. Are you, can you justify your career choice? Are you making a difference? Thank you. Cool. Where'd that come from? Go back. So, uh, thank you again. Thank you again to my fabulous speakers. That was awesome. Um, and have a great second day at GCAP. Thank you.